Hello and welcome. As we start filing everybody in, we have about 35, 36 people on their way in. And we'll give it a minute or so to allow everyone to get the volume up, get prepared for summer is open. This week with summer is open, we will be discussing Coop Warden and we're excited. This is week, week five of our now eight week series it was seven but we did bring on an encore now we understand that it's not summer everywhere and we also understand that not everywhere is open so summer is open is a series to showcase not only our open source projects but some of the people behind those open source projects and as today we're talking to Coop Warden I'm joined by two of my esteemed colleagues the first one is Flavio Castelli and he's a distinguished engineer here at SUSE, one of his main areas of focus are Linux containers and Kubernetes. Flavio loves you know, exploring new technologies and contributing to open source, um, and he's very helpful. He always answers my questions, even sometime in the dead of night for him, he's always been available, so I appreciate that. <laughs> he's also joined by Rafael Fernando Fernandez Lopez, and he's our senior software engineer here at SUSE, and he loves to learn and experiment as well. That's why made, working with these two gentlemen individuals is really awesome because they kind of play off of each other with this. So that being said, you're going to know that Coop Warden here is backed by some of the most brightest minds we have here at SUSE. But let's get started. I want to start with you, Flavio. I hear you have something strange next to you on your desk. You want to explain that real quick? Yeah, yeah. So I'm into aquariums. So I have a freshwater tank uh, sitting next to me on my desk, and I have another one in the living room. The one on my desk is a smaller one. I just uh, renovated that, so it doesn't have any livestock yet. But I plan to add uh, some shrimps and maybe a betta fish to it. That's that's awesome. I did that younger in my life, but I don't think my wife would let me do this again if I wanted to. She would uh, she would find a new husband, but. Rafa, quick question for you. I've been told that you can do something in eight hours straight, but it's not it has nothing to do with programming. What is that? I can do many things for more than eight hours, but my preferred one, I guess, is table tennis. And you know, I'm not really good at it, but I can do that, I don't know, for ten hours straight. I don't care. I really have a lot of fun with it. So we had Sheng Yang on and he was a avid tennis player. And I had to tell him I, I don't know how to play tennis. And you guys heard me talk prior to this. I had no idea. But pickleball is what I have been learning how to play. And it's a, it's a lot slower. It's more, I feel like I'm playing tennis or even table tennis, but it's kind of for us old people. It's a, it's a nice slow game. So, but as we start, I want to, this is a part of our Choose Open series. I want to ask you guys both. I'll start with you, Flavio. What does open mean to you? To me, it means to to be part of a of a bigger community of people, to collaborate together, to to achieve bigger things, and to have a chance to to learn many new things by by looking at source code and and uh, helping around. Awesome. And you, Rafa? For me, it's all about sharing knowledge. Uh, knowledge is something very important, and you can create it. Uh, you can find new knowledge, and the most important thing, in my opinion, is being open by sharing it. Awesome. So enough about you know the niceties. Let's talk about Coop Warden. I know you guys have some slides you want to share, but I'll let you, Flavio, start off. Yeah. Uh, can you give me presenter rights? I'm doing that now. I apologize. Thank you. Okay. Can you see my screen? We do see it. Good, good. So let's get started. So, um, so let's start with uh, with some data. So, as you as you probably already know, um, security is a, is a complex topic. Uh, Kubernetes is a is a complex project as well. So you mix two complex things together, and you're not going to get something which is easier. So, Kubernetes security is, is a tough topic. There was a, a survey. Try you know to, to understand better how, how Kubernetes security and how container security is perceived by, by people. The link to the survey is there. It's full of really good data. Uh, what I want to highlight today is that uh, quite a lot of the participant, 66 uh, percent of uh, of one who joined the survey, think that uh, their security story 
is, is not as good as it should be. They are afraid that they are missing something. And while they are starting to embrace more, let's say, modern ways to deal with security with DevSecOps and such, not many people are yet uh, tackling security policies as code, which is exactly the argument of, of today uh, event. So um, there are also some final interesting data. So why do people find so hard to, to get started with, uh, with security in Kubernetes? And uh, that boils down to how hard it is to build up knowledge on these skills, both uh, Kubernetes and security. So it takes time to build that uh, up inside of a team. And, uh, and not many people, you know, just uh, uh, come out of the box with both the things at, at the same time. And uh, one of the things we want to do with KubeWarden is to challenge that, to change that, and to, to make it easier for everybody to secure mm -hmm. their Kubernetes cluster using security policies. So was that akin to why this, they took the, C, the security out of the CKA because the security aspect of Kubernetes is just getting deeper and deeper and deeper? I guess that was a question for the audience, right? Well, I was kind of throwing it back to you. It's oh. just, we've know that, noticed that the, you know, that the CKA had a huge area about security and mm -hmm. then they pulled that out and made it a separate exam just for security oh, yes. because how deep it's going. Yes, yes, you, you're you're right about that. So it's it's a really wide topic. There are many many areas, and uh, uh, today we're just going to focus on on some aspects of it because, as you just said, you know, it's it's a wide universe. There are so many things in there, all right? So um, what we want to uh, to focus on today is uh, is one aspect of policies as code. When I think about policies as code, I think about RBAC policies. So, for example, specifying that uh, Rafa can create pods inside of a namespace called foobar, but he can't create them or even list them inside of a privileged namespace. Uh, you can uh, secure our containers that run inside of a Kubernetes cluster using pod security policies, which, for example, tell you I, I don't want certain users to be able to create um, uh, containers that use the host network. And the interesting aspect is that pod security policies are going to be, are deprecated and are going to be dropped from Kubernetes. And while Kubernetes is working on a solution for that, um, what we will talk about today, KubeWarden, is, is also part of that solution. So with KubeWarden, you can also come up with uh, policies that replace pod security policies. Um, another thing that came to my mind um, when, talk, when thinking about how to do policy as code with Kubernetes are networking policies. So expressing concepts such as I want this uh, uh, database container running inside of this namespace to be uh, reachable only by these selected uh, containers that are running the front-end code, but I don't want it to be reachable by others. So there are many aspects, probably I'm uh, omitting some of them, that of Kubernetes that you can configure through, uh, through code, policy as code. What we will focus today are admission controllers. For the ones who don't know about admission controllers, so the way they work is, is pretty easy. So you have uh, basically an incoming request that is, uh, is a JSON object which describes what is about to happen inside of a cluster. So for example, if a user wants to do a kubectl apply of, uh, of a pod definition, then the JSON object will describe this pod is about to be created inside of this namespace. This has been triggered by this user, and this pod has these containers inside of it, which are, have these uh, specification like annotations, uh, security contexts, all of that. So, uh, an admission controller sees exactly what is about to happen, and then using some internal logic, it decides what is the outcome of this operation. Should we accept this operation? Should we reject it entirely? Or should we maybe accept it? So for example, um, with, a, with an admission controller, you can express more complex policies, things that you can't do with uh, our back policies with networking policies. Let's say, for example, that um, you want to allow Rafa to create uh, pods inside of a namespace called uh, Foo. Uh, so you write an RBAC uh, policy for that, and that's fine. Uh, 
But what if you, on top of that, you don't want Rafa to, to use container images that are coming from the Docker Hub? So the, mm -hmm. the, the, the RBAC policy has no way to prevent that from happening. This is exactly the job of an admission controller. So with admission controller, you can look at this JSON object which is describing the pod that Rafa is about to be to create, and then you can decide if the, the, the pod is using only container images coming from uh, your internal registry, then you're going to accept it. If it is using one or more container com, uh, containers coming from Docker Hub, you're going to reject it. You can also mutate that, and let's say, for example, that you want to enforce uh, uh, all the pods to have certain labels, for example, because you want to do some cost tracking based on labels, on workloads and such. So you might write an admission controller that inspects all the different pods that you are about to create. And if a user forgot to add one label, you can you know, add it behind the scene because using some internal logic because you know that this user should use this label or all the workloads inside of certain namespace must have a certain label, that kind of stuff. So they're really, really powerful, um, but uh, they're not so accessible, meaning that if you want to write an admission controller, they are structured basically as uh, uh, webhooks. So they are... Uh, web servers that are exposing a certain API, and the and the Kubernetes API server is is reaching out to them to to validate uh, or mutate or reject a request. Then, but if you want to write an admission controller on your own, you're going to to do a lot of stuff. Re keep repeating yourself. Uh, funny thing on the on the chalkboard, uh, I wrote exactly what you have to do. So you keep uh, you know. <laughs> doing certificate management, you keep uh, registering your admission controller against the Kubernetes, you keep building container images for your application. So this is you know, a lot of repetition. And uh, because of that, there are better ways to write policies code on top of Kubernetes. So there are currently what are called policy frameworks for Kubernetes. There are currently these projects, there is Open Policy Agent or Gatekeeper, they are basically the same, let's say. Then you have uh, Kyverno, and finally you have Kubewarden. So all these projects, you can imagine them as kind of a platform as, as a service, but just for policies. So they provide a platform on top of which you uh, deploy and enforce uh, policies so that you can focus just on, on the blue box that I was showing before. So you don't have to, you just focus on, on the business logic, you know, and this is what you're going to be running on top of these platforms. And I don't know how much familiar you are with that, but you might be aware that Open Policy Agent has been around since quite some time. Kyverno is a, is a more fresh project. And Kubewarden, we just uh, let's say started that. I think it's going on since maybe a year. So uh, the question you might have is, uh, why did you actually you know, come up and create uh, a new policy engine? Why, why are you trying to, 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 to create something instead of reusing or improving what is around there? Mm -hmm. So, um, to answer that, uh, I think it's important for us to, to talk about you know, the two personas that are using policies, that are dealing with a policy frameworks. So you have policy authors who are the ones writing the policies, and then you have operators who are the one consuming policies written by, by themselves or, by, or written by other people. So we think with Kubewarden that we can improve uh, the experience of, of both these personas. So starting from the users who write a policy, uh, what we want them to do is to, to, to have a complete freedom about uh, how to write these policies. So with projects such as uh, Open Policy Agent or Kyverno, you have to learn some specific uh, languages. For Open Gatekeeper, you have to learn how to use Rego, which is a query language. And with uh, Kyverno instead, you have to basically learn how to express business logic uh, using YAML. You write YAML files with some selectors that they created, and you have to you know, figure out how to, how to write your business logic with, with these tools. And that's fine. I mean, maybe you are going to, to, to be productive with that in a short amount of time, but uh, that basically puts a burden, I think, on, on, on the people who have to write the policies and have to maintain them because we're talking about code after all. So you have to then 
teach how to, to use these uh, languages to, to many people instead of your teams or organization because you want them to be independent, you want them to be able to peer review themselves. So we don't want that to happen with Kubernetes. So with Kubernetes, what we did uh, was to, to to basically leverage the power of WebAssembly. So with WebAssembly, you get this flexibility because you basically write code using your favorite programming language, could be Go, it could be Rust. There are many programming languages that target WebAssembly. And then you run this source code of your policy through the compiler and you end up having what is called a WebAssembly module. And this WebAssembly module is something that once built, you can run it everywhere. So that uh, allows you, for example, as a policy author, to write a policy on your laptop, which might be an Apple machine or uh, using the latest Apple Silicon. You, you can write your policy, you compile it as a WebAssembly module, and then the very same WebAssembly module, without any change, you can take it and run it on top of your Kubernetes cluster, which is running on top of Linux on x86 or even on ARM. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter the operating system. It doesn't matter the architecture. WebAssembly is really, as I said, built once and, and deploy everywhere. And this is a really powerful concept that simplifies a lot, I think, the user experience. And last but not least, uh, we are talking about a project which is in the security space. So we want our policies to be uh, to be secure themselves, to not become an attack vector. And WebAssembly again is going to help us with uh, with with this issue, with this challenge. That's because WebAssembly, for ones who don't know about it, is something that started as a way to extend the browser to make it possible to run. Uh, more complex code in the browser through kind of a plugin system. And of course, the browser is a, as a huge attack surface and you don't want, you know, to 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 expose uh, end users to, 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 to malicious code. And so WebAssembly has been decided, for, designed from the ground up with security in mind. So it's, uh, it's uh, evaluated inside of a secure sandbox, which is completely isolated from the host, is also isolated from the other WebAssembly modules that might be evaluated at the same time on your computer. It's also designed with a certain you know, memory layout to prevent certain type of uh, attacks. So it's, uh, it's really a secure platform. And again, our policy is being written with WebAssembly are mm -hmm. leveraging all of that. Awesome. So talking now, shifting a bit and talking about the operators. So now you are a Kubernetes operator and you want to secure your cluster. So the uh, first thing you, you do is to, to find the policy. So we created uh, this, uh, this website, this place called Policy Hub, where you as an operator, you can go and search policies that the community has created. And then you can download this policy, run it locally, to, to try it out and then enforce that in production. So how is this policy distributed? So this is another paradigm change that we do compared to uh, the other current solutions. So our policies are WebAssembly modules, as I said before, and these WebAssembly modules are distributed inside of container registries. Everybody as container registries. I mean, this is where you store all your container images. So inside of the very same uh, container registries that you use to distribute your container images, you can also store uh, these cube warden uh, policies. So you can store them inside of this registry. And the nice thing is that our WebAssembly modules are not just code. They, they are enriched with uh, additional metadata that is provided by the policy author. And this metadata provides you information about who created the policy, the license, but most important, and many other things, but most important of all, the documentation on how to, about how to use the policy travels together with the policy. It explains to you how to configure that, how to use that, what to expect from it. And mm -hmm. also this metadata can be used to quickly scaffold, and here we go to the last step, how to enforce a policy. So of course we have a Kubernetes integration, we have custom resources that describe our policies, but how to create um, you know, YAML files that are describing uh, these policies? Well, we provide tooling that uh, is leveraging 
what is embedded into the policy object as metadata so that you mm -hmm. can quickly scaffold this policy and, and then deploy that in production. So I spoke about all of that, but uh, I think it's better to see that uh, live in action. And, and for that, I would give the presenter right to, to Rafa, who has a really nice so, demo coming up. So as I do that, I have a few questions. To yeah. Give him a, an opportunity to get a screen ready. Um, you said that there's metadata in there. We're, we also have versioning in there for those WebAssemblies. So, you know, when there's time, you know, for whatever reason, we're upgrading the, all that's stored, stored in the metadata as well. Yes, yes. Awesome. So the, the policy versions are, sorry, the, yeah, the policies are versioned as a regular OCI artifacts. So, but the metadata is also, including the version is also burned, embedded into, into the actual policy. So you can okay. always keep track of that within the registry itself correct uh it's actually inside of the inside of the policy itself so uh -huh, okay. yeah so uh that's also nice because if you if you have like uh an on-premise registry that you mm -hmm. you use to to deploy your container images because you don't want to reach to an external one you can just uh, you know copy a policy from the from a central registry to a second one and all the metadata travels together with it. You don't have to, you know, to think about what are the other things that I have to synchronize between the two registries. You just move around this uh, WebAssembly file and you're done. Awesome. I think Raf is ready. Raf, are you ready to go for this awesome demo? Yes, I'm, I'm ready. I guess you can hear me. Uh, everything is yes. good, right? Yep. Okay, so uh, let's let's go with an example of uh, of a few things. Uh, first, I would like to go with uh, the demo is going to be all about ingress, uh, so we can we can see the different angles of of the ingress resources on Kubernetes. So first, what we are going to do is to run the we are we are going to look for an ingress policy that we have on the policy hub, as Flavio has already described. We are going to look into that, see what is available over there. Then uh, we are going to find something we can improve on that policy. We are going to uh, propose a new policy that we can take advantage of. And this will be a kind of an exercise if you want to take advantage of that for, for Thursday. And then we will deploy that on top of Kubernetes uh, and see how it behaves and see if it, if it works as expected. So uh, let's, let's see uh, what do we have uh, on the Cube Warden Hub uh, for ingresses. So I go to the KubeGuardian uh, hub over here, so hubkubeguardian.io, and then I basically search over here for ingress. You can also search uh, by other things, like in this case, these are free from kind of text. It looks into the descriptions, for example, of the policies. It looks on different things, but uh, you can also search by kind of resources. So what are the policies that work on the ingress resource? What are the policies that work on the pod resource, for example? This is uh, this is generated depending on what policies exist. It's not that only we only support this. Uh, it's only that we only have uh, policies that right now support all these um, all these uh, kind of resources. Uh, for example, we have uh, policies that work on all, on all kind of policies. Uh, so let's look at the ingress one, as I was saying. And you can see that you can see it works, on, of course, on resource ingresses. It has some keywords. Uh, we see that this is a validation, validation policy. I can talk a little more about that later. Uh, we see the registry where this is stored. Uh, we are using, as uh, Fabio said before, a regular OCI registry. So the, for example, the Docker distribution uh, registry works, uh, the GitHub registry works. All those are OC compliant in this case because we need the OC artifacts to spec over there. And let's open the homepage of this of this policy. So if I go over here, I see some some information. Uh, we have uh, some descriptions, a regular GitHub uh, project, and basically uh, every policy has settings, has a concept of settings. So I can write a policy once, and depending on the settings, I can tweak uh, some things or, or configure some things or some behaviors. I can even deploy the same policy several times with different settings, for example, if I want. So uh, I'm going to focus right now on the required TLS uh, flag over here. We also have a low port, for example, or deny ports. Uh, this will be basically ignored if the if the RI is empty. So in this case, uh, in this case, I will focus on the required TLS one. 
Uh, and so now that we see this, we, we see examples here, for example, required TLS, what it's going to do basically is to ensure that every host uh, inside the ingress is going to be uh, set up as TLS as well on the ingress itself. So it's an offline check, let's say, in the sense that the policy only needs information from this ingress and the resource that it's evaluating. So it's a list, uh, it just has to compare two lists, right? Uh, mm -hmm. what, are, what are the ingresses that I have, uh, the, the hosts, and if I do have TLS entries for each one of them. Okay, so uh, let's, let's run the demo. I have uh, it over here. And so uh, one thing that we can do is to run KWCTL. So what is KWCTL? KWCTL is a CLI tool that we have on Cube Warden to do local operations in our environment, let's say. So you can run policies on top of Kubernetes, as we have said before, we are going to run that as well. But before we do that, we need something, right? That, you know, it's local. We can uh, run our policies locally against some targeted, uh, requests uh, for coming from Kubernetes, for example, and we want to try that our policies behave as we expect. And we would also like not only to check if our policies behave as we expect, the ones that we are developing, but the ones that we also pull from the internet, right, and from other registries or from the Cube Warden Hub. So we have QWCTL for this. It's kind of the CLI tool, the, the go-to CLI tool for, for Cube Warden. And so we can list policies as we can do, for example, with Docker images. Uh, and basically what is going to happen here is we have an empty output uh, because I didn't download any policy yet. And what I can do is to pull one policy as I would do with Docker, for example, Docker pull uh, some, some image. And in this case, I will KWCTL pull uh, this, uh, this uh, policy that is coming from a registry. You can see that on the schema of the URL. Uh, you can pull this from an HTTP uh, resource as well. But of course, the registry is probably uh, something that you are more used to in this case because it's what you used to distribute uh, images, container images. So it makes a lot of sense to use that for policies as well. And mm -hmm. so you can see that you have the host here, the path, and again, the same as you would have with a Docker image or with a container image, the tag that you want to use. So let's pull that. Uh, it's now pulling. And now uh, what happens if we list that again? So we are going to get uh, some information here. Uh, we get the policy. We get whether this uh, policy is mutating or not, if it's context aware, and what is the SHA of this policy. So we can check if the policies, the, the contents of the policy are not uh, modified, the size of the policy as well. Uh, mutating basically means uh, that you can either have only validating policies that are going to say yes, no, I accept or I reject this request from the API server, uh, or I can also mutate the request. Like I will add default label. If I don't have this label, I will add a default one, for example. So the mutating, a mutating policy could do that, for example. Context aware is also something very interesting. Uh, we said before that we are going to do an offline check in this sense. Like uh, in this case, we are checking the ingress resource and we can check in isolation. Uh, comparing two lists within this ingress resource, whether all the entries have also a TLS entry. But what if we wanted to do some kind of cross check, like for example, does this host exist in other ingress resource? Uh, so this is what we call context aware. Uh, if a policy is context aware, it means that Cube Gordon is going to make some context uh, available visible to this policy so it can take decisions based on the context of the cluster and this uh, in this case this policy is not context aware so we can inspect it and we have uh, the inspect command over here we just run kdlct inspect with the url of the policy and we get this nice output uh, basically i have some information like the title description author uh, you have also the license whether it's mutating or not context aware protocol person is something internal to us what KWCTL version was used to annotate the policy. And then we have uh, the, the policy author can say on what kind of resources this policy works. And this is very nice because then the policy doesn't need to do some kind of defensive programming like, am I an ingress or no? I, am I evaluating an ingress or not? Uh, basically, this, this uh, policy says that it works on ingresses resources only and operations create an update. And then uh, you can provide a free form text on the usage uh, where the policy author can provide you information 
uh, on how to use the policy or how to con or how to configure it. Uh, the very nice thing about this information, as Flavio said before, is not living inside the registry, it's living within the binary. So when you copy the .wasm file anywhere, this information flies with the policy itself. So it goes always uh, with the policy. So now let's try to, to, uh, to, to run this policy with, uh, with a resource. I have uh, an ingress policy here, a request coming from the API server where TLS is not enabled for all the entries. And you can see here, for example, I have toolbar com, but I don't have uh, TLS anywhere here. So let's let's uh, try to run this. Uh, so we are going to try to run it now. And the thing is that right now the settings are empty, which means that by default on my programming language, what I'm uh, defaulting this, this boolean is going to default to false, which basically means that I'm not requiring TLS, right? So this request is not going to be rejected. And this is the case. I get uh, the output and the allowed uh, parameter or the allowed attribute is true. And so, yeah, let's, let's see now again, but making it completely explicit. We require TLS false, we get, of course, the same result. All right, so now uh, let's see what happens uh, if we enforce TLS. Right. So uh, right now you see on the settings of this policy, I'm going to require TLS, true? And so what is going to happen at this point is that not all hosts are, have TLS enabled and allowed is false. This is going to be rejected and this server is going to be forwarded to the user of the, the user that is target, targeting the API server. It could be KeepCTL, it could be some client uh, using client Go, for example, or other uh, consumer of the API. So now uh, let's let's see uh, what happens if uh, TLS is enabled on all hosts. So in this case, I have just one host, Fubarcom again, and I have TLS enabled on Fubarcom. So this this is this should be fine, right? So let's uh, run the policy against it and see what happens. Uh, required TLS is true again, as you can see, and now it's allowed. So uh, as you can see, uh, this is basically what uh, we have on this example. And uh, what happens with the ingress in this case? We are looking at the ingress and we are now enforcing that TLS is enabled for all entries. But uh, let's say I'm, I'm now developing uh, something on my cluster. I'm going to use an ingress resource, but maybe I want to enforce something a little more hard, let's say. So um, what happens if I want to also say, I'm using Cert Manager, and so I, I, I can use uh, the cluster issuers from, issuers from CERT Manager, and I use this annotation from CERT Manager to request a cluster, a certain cluster issuer for, for the ingress. And so I can, for example, let's, let's go with an example because I can, uh, I have basically a cluster over here, um, and I can see the cluster issues that I have. This is a cluster that I have uh, for my own. So I have two cluster issues, issues right? Uh, production and staging. So now let's imagine that you are in an environment in which you have production and you don't want to create any kind of staging certificates inside production, which makes sense, right? Because if you by mistake do that, anyone who is going to access your service is going to get an invalid certificate because it's not a valid CA in that sense, right? And so what we want to do now, and this, this ingress policy is not powerful enough to do this, is to, to create some kind of uh, policy that does this. And let's, let's create uh, out of this uh, an exercise, an exercise that you can start now. Uh, let's, let's look at that because if I go to the KubeWarden Policy Hub, now this is all about annotations, right? If I look uh, at how I can create this kind of uh, resources, these ingresses, I go into, into my ingress over here. And what I have is an annotation that says which cluster issuer I'm going to use with Cert Manager. In my mm -hmm. case, this is let's compute production, okay? Uh, but yeah, I, we want to, something to enforce this. So let's look into the, into the policy hub, what we can do in order to enforce this. And I look for annotations and I don't have anything, uh, but I know that we have something regarding labels. We have something called safe labels, all right? And we have this example, well, not this example, this is a perfectly valid um, policy 
that is able to control what labels are actually uh, created on any kind of resource. You can deny labels, you can constrain labels, basically saying this key needs to uh, needs to pass or match this rex, for example. So this is an exercise that I, I, I would love you to do if, if you are interested, is basically forking uh, this, this one or, or starting out from, from this safe labels one policy mm -hmm. and create one that is called safe annotations policy. You know, it's not only about looking for the labels, but it's looking for the annotations. And this way we can take advantage of this. And now if we have that, uh, that policy, it will look into the annotations. And then I can say, okay, on this namespace, the cluster easier needs to be production. And now I won't be able to make this mistake ever. I won't be able to, in this given namespace, if you have a namespace, namespace production, for example, and you deploy a policy that is targeting every resource in the, inside this namespace, you will never uh, be able to commit the mistake of uh, using Let's Encrypt staying here, right? Um, that will be an interesting, an interesting exercise. But I have to admit, I already did, I already did that, okay? So I, I have this uh, safe annotations policy, and uh, if I look into my registry, so I have a registry over here. You can see regular images like OpenSUSE Leap with tags. I also have uh, my Cube Warden safe annotations policy over here, and we are going to actually run this one uh, from 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 this container uh, from this container registry, and we are going to run that on Kubernetes. But before that, uh, let me try to, to do some runs with KWCTL, like manually. Uh, but I have to say, I, I did this, I wrote this, I just copied the safe labels one, uh, changed that to be to target annotations. But if you do the exercise and you share that with us, uh, of course, we are going to use your, your policy. We can talk about that. Uh, if, you, if nobody submits that, then I will submit mine. But it would be amazing if someone can contribute this policy. And so, yeah, let's uh, let's try to run uh, some some uh, things uh, here with KWCTL. So let's say that, that uh, as I said before, it's very similar to the labels one. Uh, we are going to do a KWCTL run. We have settings JSON. You can also provide this uh, as a text file, but right now I'm just using JSON over here on the CLI itself. And so I can constrain the annotation server uh, manager cluster user to let's include production. And then we have the request uh, path that is, uh, trust me, this is one taking the uh, staging ingress. This is basically, I can, I can bat it now or cut it uh, in a second. And then I run uh, the policy that is coming from the registry. It will be automatically pulled if it's not already pulled. And so I can actually go and run that and see that, yeah, it's not a load. The value of certain manager cluster issuer doesn't pass the user certificate constraint. So yeah, what happens if I try to do this, but with production? So let me. Ah, that works. So as you can see, uh, we we can uh, do that leave. So yeah, uh, I can now say instead of uh, instead of uh, this, this can be a let's encrypt staging. Oops. And uh, yeah, I am targeting production, so now it doesn't work. But now if I try staging over here, then mm -hmm. it will be accepted. So that's it. Uh, that's the KWCTL run part of it. So we are now missing the part where, okay, this is running. You have, you can run these policies with different settings. Uh, you can pull them from registries. Uh, then there's the, the other part where we will have to, if you run KWCTL, you can see that uh, you can, push to a registry, regular registry, OCI artifacts enabled registry, you can annotate the, the, the policy uh, and you can basically also create a scaffold for Kubernetes. Uh, we are going to see that in a second, uh, but I can also do a KWCT and inspect. So uh, if I do an inspect, as we were saying before, yeah, basically you, you see, we saw that on the previous example, I can just see all the information that is living inside the binary. All right, so now let's let's go for the second one. So um, if I go with uh, with the Kubernetes demo, let's go and run this. I have here a cluster. Let me check that again. It's a bit slow. Sorry for that. 
Uh, so yeah, let's let's try to run this example now. So you know that I have this uh, this registry. There is no magic. Okay, so I have here the the OCR artifacts. I have here the policy itself. So now let's let's try to run that. Okay, yeah. So we miss that. And now we are going to see uh, this ingress that is taking the staging one, the one that we have uh, seen before. So this one has this annotation, let's encrypt staging. And now let's try to create this uh, just to make sure that it, it can be created. Okay, it's, it's now created. And now we are going to check uh, the production one. So uh, the cluster admission policy, basically the, the way that we run KWCTL before is basically this, this is the way that we are going to evaluate policies on, inside Kubernetes. Uh, since we deploy the controller and if you follow the instructions from Robert on how to deploy KubeWarden, you will have this uh, CRDs already created in your cluster. You can mm -hmm. create the cluster admission policy resource. And then what I'm going to do here is just give it a name uh, this is just something descriptive for me to understand. I have the module, and this is where this is going to put, be pulled from. And this is my registry. And now we have the settings. Uh, we saw that before running that with KWCTL, I have these constraint annotations, and now we are going to enforce that this key has to be this value. And this is the the resource that where is going that is going to target inside Kubernetes. And so our controller will make will take care of creating the, the validating webhook, webhook configuration or the mutating webhook configuration in the case that this was true. But in this case, we are not mutating anything. So uh, that's perfectly fine. So let's remove all ingresses. Uh, we created an ingress before. Let's remove everything. And now let's deploy this cluster admission policy. So now it's created. And now let's wait for it to be active. Uh, it's true that we might have a better condition, to be honest. Right now, right now we can QCTL wait on this one that is the last one that we are reconciling. Basically, when we enable the policy by creating the webhook configuration. So uh, let's wait for it. Now it's, the condition is met. So now we can actually try uh, and go and create a staging ingress. This should now be rejected, right? Because we just deployed the, the policy over there. And you can see that error from the server, and this is the error you get from the API server. Uh, the admission webhook, safe annotations, let's encrypt uh, production, this is how I named the policy, denied the request. And the error is the one, the same thing that we had with, K with KWCTL. The value of ser manager cluster issuer doesn't pass user-defined constraint. And this is the, the actually the constraint that I created. So now let's try to create a production ingress. This is the ingress that we are going to try to create. And you can see uh, cluster easier has the density production one. Uh, now let's try to create that. And this should be allowed. And you can see that it's perfectly created. Now everything has been cleaned up, so I cannot uh, share more about that. But uh, yeah, that's that's uh, everything you can do. And this is the, the end of the demo. Um, you can do many, many things with this. Uh, like uh, you, you can get ahead of time, for example, and try to create a policy, uh, for example, uh, to to stop serving, to stop creating ingresses, for example, for API versions that are now deprecated or are going to be the, the completely removed from the API server. They, they are not going to be served anymore. So you mm -hmm. can get ahead of time, for example, and deploy this kind of policies on a staging, for example, on your staging environment, and then you will have you know the chance to to fix all those things in your deployments uh, and yeah i think that's that's it for the demo um, so yeah awesome thank you very much so for the challenge this week i actually got an opportunity to walk through the quick start guide through coop warden and as uh, i did about a dozen times because i actually recorded myself going through it touches the surface of what this tool can do but you guys will get a chance to like go in do exactly that and if you have a hard time you can watch the video and just get yourself through it but it should be straightforward enough where you don't have to but we might have some questions from the community so i'm going to take a moment take a breather here and see who we have questions why so first is coming from mark harvey and he rafa he really loves your command line tool that allows you to kind of pause and go what tool were you using there because i think everyone's like how did you do that magic 
It's uh, let me open that. It's it's a really nice one actually. Yes, I really love it. So, so it's actually this one. Uh, I I can I can paste the link over there. So it's it's uh, this one. It's called Demo from Sasa Groner, and it's pretty oh. cool. Yeah. If you can post that in the in the chat there, I'm sure yes. everyone wants to. Uh, I might put that. it in solid. So, um, so I have a, you know some of the questions that we're getting. Um, you know, my questions are, you know, what? How many kid contributors uh, does Coop Burden have currently on staff? So um, the project started with just uh, myself and Rafa. Now we mm -hmm. have uh, another guy, Victor, who joined us. And there is Rahul who just uh, joined uh, part time, so just a uh, friend help people. And, and we have Klaus uh, who keeps us in, in order, he's our project manager. <laughs> Make sure we, we tackle things in the right order and help us to get things done. All right. these projects, all these projects have a project manager. And what features are you guys currently working on? You guys, can you guys give us a little like a hint of what's coming in the pipe for Coop Warden? Yeah, sure. So we want to improve uh, our Kubernetes integration, the way mm. that we uh, we structure that. So right now we just um, we just have uh, this cluster admission policy, custom resource, which is defining policy. All the policies are then loaded by a single uh, policy evaluator. I mean, it's a deployment with many replica set. Um, it's already HA from that point of view, but all mm -hmm. the policies of the cluster are, are loaded uh, into the same deployment. We want to allow people to partition that so that, they, for example, if they have a noisy namespace with many requests coming from, they can allocate a dedicated uh, policy server deployment for that. Or if they want you know, to run uh, critical policies, um, on, on dedicated instances, they can do that. So we want to provide a new custom resource which describes a policy server so that you mm -hmm. can have multiple policy server uh, deployments with different kind of replica size and different kind of uh, scheduling criteria and, and all of that. So this is one thing that we are working on. So one of the questions I've been asking everybody is, you know, who's the target audience from this? And I think from your talk earlier, this is more of the policy writers and the operators themselves to kind of make their lives easier. And, you know, they can go through pull policy that they need um, out of the registry or put it into their own registry and then, you know, apply a YAML or JSON to, you know, what policies they need per cluster, correct? Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, in terms of other things coming up, there is one really interesting feature that we are currently working on. So you might have already been using um, something like Open Policy Agent or Gatekeeper to, to, to secure your clusters. Now you see Keyboard and you are interested, but you have already invested quite some energies and time in finding the right policies and maybe writing them. So we want to uh, smooth your transition to, to Keyboard. And so, um, Rego policies, which is the language that is used by Open Policy Agent and by Gatekeeper, Rego policies can be built into WebAssembly modules. So we are now adding the, the possibility to load not just the cube warden policies, but also uh, OPA or Gatekeeper policies on top of the same platform, which is cube warden, so that you can use uh, whatever you know tool solution you, you want. So it's going to be kind of universal platform where you can run your policies. So I have a question from uh, Alexander is asking, does this functionality replace OPA Gatekeeper can, and this tool that you guys are, are focusing on is something that could help with that, uh, I don't wanna say migration, but to apply that to a web assembly and then you know apply it to your cluster, is that correct? Yes, yes, exactly. So with uh, with this uh, feature, once this feature is done, uh, you can take your uh, OPA Gatekeeper policies, build them once uh, as uh, as uh, WebAssembly uh, modules, and then you can use uh, KWCTL to annotate them, to push them into a registry, and then you just uh, deploy Kubewarden only on top of your cluster, and from there you can use uh, Kubewarden policies or this. Uh, policies that you com converted, let's say, from, from Rego. Awesome. Now, Dimitri has a question here. Do you build, compile your policies in GitHub? Yes, yes. So uh, policies are, for us, a real code, which means that we have GitHub Actions 
that are you know running unit tests against that they are doing linting this is also a really nice advantage you know if you are a policy offer you have already you know uh, your own set of tools that you use to compile your code to validate that you have code conventions inside of your organization you are using some libraries from i don't know the go ecosystem the rust ecosystem so you can keep using all of that and that includes also ci cd systems so uh, all our policies are, are built uh, inside of uh, GitHub Actions, and they are then uh, published on uh, on a registry through uh, through automation. You can also do uh, like end-to-end -end tests for policies by using KWCTL. So as Rafa showed before, uh, you can use KWCTL to run a policy against some setting, and you can do the very same thing inside of CI/CD system. We have examples for that. Awesome! Awesome! I don't think we have any, do we have any more questions? For, oh, hold on, two more coming here, one more. How do you deal with different languages? Dimitri, I don't, uh, can you kind of help us qualify? Is it different languages for WebAssembly or? Uh... Uh, Rafa, do you want to take oh. this one? I don't know if my oh. video is, is breaking up, so. Yeah, uh, uh, we, are, we, we, are, we actually support different languages. Uh, we have uh, Go, for example, with a tiny Go compiler because the Go compiler on its own cannot build um, WebAssembly programs that are not browser targeted. We support Rust. We have uh, Swift over there. Um, we have assembly uh, script. Assembly script as well. Which is kind of TypeScript. Uh, yeah, and we are going to support OPA uh, in, in a short time. So yeah, and of course more and more languages are going to come. So yeah, what we what we do is we provide an SDK for each one of these languages that you can use as a policy offer to to write uh, your policy. Basically, you mm -hmm. can imagine our uh, policies as as kind of libraries. So they are they have to expose a certain API so that uh, we can then you know invoke uh, this API to feed data, and they have to reply back using a certain format so that we can have this communication. And this is uh, done by using these SDKs that we provide. We also mm -hmm. provide some template repos that you can use to quickly scaffold a new policy from scratch, and we do that for all the, the languages that we support. All right, so Dimitri has another question. Do you, Java SDK, is that out there? I didn't look and personally see what's out there uh, SDK-wise. Dimitri, yeah, do you? So, uh, Java and WebAssembly, they are not there yet. Let's say that. So that's the main okay. issue. All right. As a .NET side, I'm not even going to ask if there's a .NET SDK, but I mean, I, I can't even uh, .NET Yeah, side. yeah. With, with .NET, uh, it's interesting. There is something that we would like to explore so the Mono project can build uh, WebAssembly binaries. Uh, we don't have an SDK for Kubewarden for that yet, but mm -hmm. if there is anybody, that applies to all languages, you know. If you have a language that is supporting WebAssembly, but we do not offer an SDK for Kubewarden, please reach out to us, and we are eager to work with you to, to get it uh, done. Awesome, awesome. Now, we're coming close to the end of time here, but I want to get an opportunity to uh, bring up the, our final slide deck to talk about, you know, a call to action. You know, what can community members do to get involved with this? Let me see if I can share that. Or if you share, if uh, let me share a screen, I can pull the slide up. Sure. Already there. Let me, uh, let me make you presenter again. It is all yours, sir. Okay, here you go. Awesome. So this is every way you can get involved with this project. First is to download and use, provide some feedback. Um, we run on an operation of GitHub stars as currency. So if you like the project, obviously give us a star on GitHub. Um, you can contribute to source. We just talked about the opportunity to, you know, build out an SDK if the supported uh, WebAssembly language is out there and we don't have an SDK. Um, that's obviously an issue. But you can also log issues when you find them in GitHub. Join us at community.susa.com. Um, if you want to know more about Kubewarden, it's kubewarden.io. You can follow Kubewarden on Twitter. This is a, a great, anytime you guys have a release, you'll see it there on Twitter. Um, Rancher Labs, you got, everyone here should be on there. Flavio underscore Castelli. Um, E-S-R-E-S-L-I-B-R-E. -E. Is, that, is that you, Rob? It's Spanish. It is living. It is, it is it is you okay and you can follow me on twitter if you'd like 
but get involved. Challenges are really coming this afternoon along with the recording of this uh, of this video. And next week we'll be featuring Opinio. And if you don't know what that is, stay tuned next week. Join us for that. Flavio, Rafa, thank you guys very much for joining us. This was awesome. I loved it. Uh, this is one of the most exciting ones we've had to date. And I actually got to play with this with Rancher Desktop. So for me, it was a win all around. It's my new favorite toys here at SUSE. So that uh, being can I can I add one last thing? Uh, sure. You can also reach out on on Slack. So if you go to the keyboard and website, you can find links to Slack. We are on the Rancher user Slack, but we are also on the Kubernetes Slack uh, awesome. on, under the keyboard and uh, channel. Awesome, and I, I'll update this slide deck because we always we always uh, publish this PDF in our challenge with our challenges. I'll update that link as well in here, so you guys can go to the Slack channel. Sorry about that. That's a miss oversight on my side, but also Raph, ours. <laughs> yep. Flavio, Raphael, thank you again. And community members, we'll see you on the community.susa.com as well. Thank you guys. Thank Bye. you. Have a lovely day. Great day.